will you join with me please for our call to worship? O Lord, you are righteous and just. You forgave your people. You pardoned our sin. Salvation is at hand. Stand in fear and great awe. God's glory is drawing near and will dwell in our land soon and very soon. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this evening we pray for your presence. We anticipate your arrival among us as you've promised. Come into our midst, come into our hearts, come into our homes and our community, into our schools and our workplaces. May we welcome you everywhere, making room for you, preparing for you, anticipating your arrival with joy and reverence. We commit this season of Advent to becoming ready. Shine your light on those nooks and crannies we keep in the shadows. Sweep the cobwebs from our long hidden doubt and fear. Repair our torn and wounded places. We long for your arrival. Amen. I invite you now to join with me as we go into our time of prayer, we begin by confessing our sins before Almighty God. Advent is a time of waiting, and waiting is really anything but passive. As we prepare to make room for Christ to dwell within us, we acknowledge our own sin, our sin that stands in the way of us living life to the fullness that Christ promised. So let us be truthful with God in the presence of one another. Let us give God the gift of our honest and humble confession. There are many roads to choose, yet only one leads to life. God, we confess our desire to choose roads that to so many things that keep us from you. We are so easily distracted, tempted by paths that seem to lead to good things, wealth, prosperity, health, and yet they never satisfy. Keep us on the path that leads to you. Give us a desire for the things that are of you, that we know will bring us ultimate joy and to you great glory. Thank you for never leaving us behind when we wander. Draw us back to you. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Friends, believe this good news that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Every time the Christ body comes together, we come together with the first thing in our mind of praying for others. Paul tells Timothy to enter prayers without ceasing, supplications, intercessions on behalf of all of those. And so this evening as we uh, pray, we seek to remember any and all within our community, uh, within the realm of those whom we know and love uh, who stand in need of prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O oh God, breathless we come to this place of prayer. We are out of breath from running, running from the house to the car, from the car to the mall, from the mall to a meeting, from the meeting to the market, and then 
running back home again. We hustled wrap presents and hastily addressed cards. We pray, Lord, that you just kind of slow us down. Turn us around. Turn us around from the holiday to the holy day. Slow us down to a walk. Let us walk with the children we love and gaze at the Christmas tree admiring the ornaments and telling their story. Let us walk to the shops and take time to be kind and notice those who need our attention. And let us take time to turn them around to you. Let us walk to the fire crackling in the fireplace and write our cards, pausing in our busyness to pray for the name on that envelope that they might know of your peace and your love. Let us listen with our hearts open to the majestic music which tells of the coming of the Prince of Peace. Let us meander to the manger and Ponder like Mary did and wait with expectation for the birth of our God. Slow us down, Lord, and turn us to you. Bethlehem beckons to all of us, even to those who come reluctantly. And those who are unable because of illness or infirmity or disease. We offer our prayers today for those who have been trampled on the journey. We pray that the life of this child born in the darkness of the night and the depth of winter might be a cause for hope in the dark winter of their lives. We need to be reminded that we will not find the truth of who you are in tinsel or bright lights or gleaming holiday parties, but only in the stillness of our hearts where we can hear you say very gently, do not be afraid as we prepare to receive you anew and afresh, quiet us, attune our spirit to your spirit for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we look to the reading of the scripture, we find in Isaiah chapter 40, Words that come to the people of Israel as prophecy. Isaiah 40, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sins been paid for, that she has received from the Lord double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed in all people. We'll see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are like grass. And all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, flowers fail, but the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of, the God, word of God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. 
See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm. His reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends to his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them close to his heart, and he gently leads those that have young. Our second scripture this evening is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. But do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will dissolve by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven, new earth, where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. When I think of how far he came from glory, came to dwell among the lonely, such as I, who suffer shame. On Mount Carey, take my place, and I ask myself this question Who am I? Who Oh, am I that a king would bleed 
can die for. Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thine will. Nothing that I could ever This question as I ask myself this question I ask myself this question who am I Let us pray. Lord God, we ask this evening that you would just baptize us with your Holy Spirit. Bathe us in the Spirit so that as we, as we hear the word read, uh, that we would receive your good news with great joy. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to share with you a text from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for it. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now John wore clothing made of camel's hair with leather belts around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I'll baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Have you ever played that game called gossip or rumors? You, you know the one. It's kind of where everybody gets in a circle and you begin by one person whispering in the ear of the person next to them. Uh, some message of some kind, very softly, very quietly, where nobody else can hear. And then that person has to, in turn, whisper what they receive into the ear of the person next, and it just, it goes on and on and on all the way around the circle, and everybody gets a chance to hear what is said before they tell it to the next person. Now, it's always amazing to me that when we, when it goes around full circle, it's hard to imagine that it gets as scrambled and even as unrecognizable as it does. The what comes back around has little to do with the original message at all. Well, this isn't just in the world of games. We find it that despite this tremendous world of high tech that we live in, you know, with all of our instantaneous communication, our uh, emails, our faxes, our Snapchats, our uh, what, you know, whatever you want to call all these things, all these messages that are floating through the ether, stories still seem to get through our culture on that old gossip chain. And typically these stories are altered and adjusted to fit part of the country that they uh, emerge in. They reflect the economic standards of the community 
uh, the local prides and local prejudices. Some cultural rumor stories have been around for decades, and people still tend to give some of these stories a tremendous amount of credence, although there is absolutely no truth in any of them at all. You ever hear the, the, the tale about the snake and the coat at the Kmart? Did you hear that one? Or, or maybe it was the python living on the sale table at the Walmart. Or maybe the boa constrictor that was found under the collar of a mink coat at a Manhattan boutique. You see, these tales periodically just kind of surface. And what they do is they are really kind of telling us a little bit about our culture. Sometime back, there was another much more serious story began working its way kind of through the underground rumor mill. It, too, sort of reveals something about the desires and the fears that exist in this postmodern life of ours. When I first encountered this story, I um, it seemed a little too amazing to be true. To me, it, who I've, I've been dealing with the Internet for years, and uh, for me it kind of had all the earmarks of that snake in the Kmart type thing, you know, the urban legend sort of thing. But the tale persisted. And so I decided to really find out if it was true and began tracking it down to its source. And what I'm about to relate to you actually happened. And it involved a very definite time and a place and a person. The story is about the impact of the faith of one nameless, homeless street person. The impact that he's had on people over 25 years after his death. Tapes of this homeless person have been played in homeless shelters all over the United States. Thanks to the grinding of the rumor mill, this homeless person has erroneously been located in such diverse places as Miami's 7th Street and 1st Avenue, New York City's 54th and Lexington, and on the streets of other very lonely, very urban centers. In various versions of this tale, the homeless person has just kind of mysteriously disappeared, suggesting perhaps to a hopeful culture that he may have been some kind of angel in residence. It is both reassuring and remarkable that when the real story is finally heard, it is every bit as miraculous as any of the gossip versions that have been sort of circulating over the years. This story involves Gavin Bryars, England's leading musician composer. In 1971, Bryars agreed to help a friend of his, Alan Powers, with the audio aspects of a film that Powers was making about uh, street people. And the filming took place in an area around London's Waterloo Station, where there is a large number of homeless living. Well, Powers filmed various people living on the streets, catching them with the camera's eye and their daily rituals, all their trials, all their joys. Some of them were obviously drunk, some obviously mentally disturbed. Some of them were very articulate, some were incomprehensible. As Briars began to make his way through the audio and the video footage, he began to notice a kind of a constant undercurrent, a repeating sound 
that always seemed to accompany the presence of this one older man. At first, the sound seemed like just muttered gibberish. But after removing all the background street noise, cleaning up the audio tape, Briars discovered that the old man was, in fact, singing. Ironically, the footage of this old man and his muttered song didn't make the cut. But the filmmaker's loss was Briars' gain. And so he took the rejected audio tape and just could not seem to escape the haunting sounds of this homeless, nameless man. So he began to do a little research on his own into who this homeless person might be. From his film crew, Briars learned that this particular street beggar didn't drink. But neither did he engage other people in conversation. His speech, when he did speak, was virtually impossible to understand. But he was, his demeanor was, was very sunny. Though he was old and alone and filthy and homeless, he had about him a kind of a playfulness. For example, he seemed to take great delight in teasingly swapping hats with the various members of the film crew. But what distinguished this old man from all those other street people was his song. The song that he sung under his breath was a simple, repetitive, old-time Sunday school tune. But for him, it seemed to be a mantra. And he would sit there and quietly sing it, uninterrupted sometimes for hours on end. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. There's one thing I know, for he loves me so. And then like a loop, it would begin right back again, over and over and over again without ceasing. The old man's untrained voice never wavered one iota from pitch. He never went flat. He never changed key. The simple intervals of that tune were perfectly maintained forever how long he sung. Now, as a musician, Briars was fascinated. And so he began thinking of ways that he could arrange and orchestrate around the constant repeated lines the old man sang. One day, while playing the tape as background to some other work. Briars left the door of the studio open while he went downstairs to get a cup of coffee. And when he came back several minutes later, he found a, a normally buzzing office environment eerily still. You see that old man's quiet, quavery voice just kind of leaked out of the recording room and transformed that entire office floor. Under the spell of that stranger's voice, an office full of busy professionals had become hushed. Those who were still moving around walked very slowly, almost reverently, around the room. Many more had taken their seats, sitting there motionless at their desks, just transfixed by the voice. More than a few were openly weeping. Briars himself was absolutely stunned. Now, although he's not a believer, he simply couldn't help but be confronted by that 
mysterious spiritual power that existed in this unadorned voice. Sitting in the midst of an urban wilderness, this John the Baptist voice touched a lonely and aching place that lurks in the human heart. And it offered an unexpected message of faith and hope in the midst of the darkest, most blighted night. Briars himself started yearning for the confidence and the faith that this old man's song celebrates. He began to face what it means to feel homeless and alone even when we're sometimes sitting in the midst of our families. Briars vowed to respect this homeless person by creating a recording that would celebrate and accentuate this simple message that no matter what one's condition, Jesus loves me so. It took England's leading contemporary composer until 1993 to create and produce what he felt was a proper accompaniment to this homeless person's song of trust and obedience. This he did in partnership with one of America's leading composers, Philip Glass, who is probably most popularly known for his work Koi Nascazzi. It's a title which translated from the Hopi means life out of balance. Glass brought his musical mixture of rock realism and mysticism to the project, and the result was a CD entitled Jesus' Blood Never Failed Me Yet. What was it that convinced these leading musicians and composers to create a musical framework to preserve this old man's song? Why did an office full of busy people find themselves reduced to tears at the very sound of the voice? How did this tiny scrap of audio tape from the cutting room floor ever survive to live on for thousands of people to hear? Jesus' blood never found me yet. This one thing I know, for he loved me so. Jesus' blood never found me yet. Never found me yet. Jesus' blood never found me yet. This one thing I know, for he loved me so. Jesus' blood never found me yet. Never found me yet. Blood never found me yet. This one thing I know. This, brothers and sisters, is the Advent journey. Each of us has a broken song, a quavery voice, a frail pitch. But the Christmas message is that one homeless night long ago, in a place called Bethlehem. God wrapped humanity's broken songs and shattered chords with the music of the spheres. In the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, God gave each of our feeble attempts at singing a cosmic orchestra of surround sound spirituality. That Christmas night, our scratchy, scruffy voices were forever lifted to the skies. By the way, the old man's voice that you hear, well, he died shortly after that film crew left his street home. It was almost if when someone finally heard his song, he could leave for another place. Who knows? Maybe it was an angel after all. Let us pray. Oh God, too often in this season, waiting and spiritual preparation get shoved aside in favor of busyness and lives. 
does the quiet joy of Advent even stand a chance in the midst of such conspicuous consumption? Does the voice crying in the wilderness have any hope to be heard over the Christmas commotion? Speak to us, dear God. Speak tenderly, but speak insistently. Let the sacredness of this space and this time hold us fast so that we might leave in peace and quiet forever change. Speak to us in the deepest yearnings of our hearts. Amen. Thank you.